we're right here at Balliol College. Um, Balliol College was founded in about 1263. But remember we talked about how difficult it is to actually pin down when Oxford started. Oxford is a collection of only 35 different colleges. Um, they're spread out and around and through the city of Oxford. <coughs> Uh, some uh, the, the Balliol people, the Balliol men, would say, and women now, but would say that um, Balliol is the oldest college in Oxford. But if you go over to University College, which is where C.S. Lewis studied as an undergrad, it's where Bill Clinton didn't inhale, supposedly. Um, it actually says that on the rooms he was in. This is where Bill Clinton didn't inhale. Um, you guys might not remember that in the news. I sure do. But. Um, uh, you guys weren't even born when he was, <laughs> what am I talking about, you know? But um, anyway, so to, the, the University College would claim to be the oldest, or Merton might claim to be the oldest, or uh, St. Edmund's Hall might claim to be the oldest. <clears throat> so when, when is it actually a college of the university? That all happened slowly, incrementally. It didn't happen like one morning when they got up after breakfast, let's start a university. So keep that in mind helps you to kind of see how it just kind of radiated out over the centuries. But 1263, <clears throat> and I want you to get something. One of the things on this, uh, on the Oxford Creative Writing Masterclass that I hope you go away with is a greater appreciation of the providence of God in every, the most, the minutest detail of your life. Uh, we just had that wonderful encounter out there at the stake, as it were, at the martyr um, <clears throat> cross in the ground, all orchestrated by the Lord. In 1340s, we don't know exactly, in the 1340s, a young man from up in Yorkshire, who was a, the son of a serf, comes to Oxford to study. Now, Oxford was really pretty exclusive. It was for the wealthy, for people who had means, typically. <clears throat> it wasn't for serfs, sheep herders, serfs sons, you know, from Yorkshire. I think James Harriet, you know. Um, but there, here's, here's a, bit, a moment in church history that I really want you to get your teeth into. It. And this is relevant to what we're looking at here uh, behind, uh, behind us, here at Balliol in the garden. Um, go back before the, the 1340s, and the um, heir apparent to the Scottish throne, John Balliol, married without the approval of the Pope and the Bishop of Durham, and uh, so fell under the censure of the Bishop of Durham. And he was required to do penance. This is pre-Reformation. He's required to do penance for uh, this indiscretion. And uh, what he was required to do was to found a college of the new Oxford. So by this time, it's a um, and, um, and that there, the, one of the entrance um, scholarships, if you will, was that poor boys from the north that, that have the academic qualifications could come to the college. So, Balliol College, named for the kings of Scotland. You're thinking, how does this all work together? Why were we talking about Scotland a little bit ago? Because it's all interwoven. It's a tapestry. We've got to get it all. Um, and you, you're in the business of depositing in, 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 the, in your literary and your church history and your theological bank right now, right? So, so that gets that gets established, and one of those statutes on the on the charter of Balliol is that poor boys from the north have to come, all expenses paid. So, in 1340, back to this farm up there, they work for they work for the Lord of the Manor. You know, typically you don't own anything, but Sorry. no, that's okay. <laughs> Christiana, she anticipates. John Wycliffe's dad was really good with sheep, really really good with sheep. And it's just like Jacob, with, you know, with the goats, you know, the sheep, they just, they breed and they, they reproduce and just, just going crazy. And so the Lord of the manor says, you know, you're so good. I, I want to reward you. I'm going to give you some flocks and I'm going to give you a piece of land. This is in the Middle Ages when the land is owned by the few. It's owned by the nobility and royalty and the church. <laughs> church owns about half of England at that time, <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get that land. Um, so that was a big deal. John was his oldest son, 
and he didn't know which end of the sheet was which. <laughs> he just didn't have that. But he's picking up Latin by just going into the parish church on Sundays. Now, they, nobody understood Latin, but the whole service was in Latin. And you just went, you know, as sort of a means of grace, you know, the sacrament. You went there and you stood there, didn't understand a word. You didn't participate. Luther would call it lazy worship, right? Because like, the singing was all done for you by the experts. We're returning to that, by the way. All done for us by the entertainers. Yeah. Typically. <clears throat> But uh, they're, you know, they're, so they're worship leaders, but actually they're not leading us. They're doing it for us. Because people just murmur. They don't really sing. But, I'm on, oh, and that's another excursus. I will get on it again, <laughs> believe me. Um, but anyway, long story short, John Wycliffe's learning Latin just by sit, you know, sitting there in the, in the service. He, and he, the priest figures this out. His dad has him going. He's getting his Latin. All that. What are they going to do? Poor boys from the north are knowledgeable. <laughs> to go to Balliol, Oxford. And so, young Wycliffe comes down here in the 1340s, all expenses paid. <clears throat> right on the cusp of doing that, um, you, have, um, you have the Black Death coming into England. And Wycliffe is converted to faith in Christ, true faith in Christ, in part because he, he, he had the stuffing scared out of him <laughs> by the Black Death happening all around. Right? The Lord uses those kinds of means. And, um, and also, he's sitting under a guy named Thomas Bradwardine here at Balliol and hearing him preach the gospel and give his testimony. And this man was way ahead of his time. He, he, uh, he's he's uh, written a thesis against the Pelagians, and he's got, he's got his reformed soteriology and doctrines of grace and predestination. He's got that all down. Uh, and, and Wycliffe is hearing this, as he you know. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. But... Uh, John Balliol uh, dies before he could establish the college. But his widow, as sort of a means of grace for her husband, you know, you did this kind of thing, you prayed, you, you know, you gave money, you endowed stuff, you know, to try and get your loved one out of purgatory. She moves down here to Oxford from Scotland, and she endows the college. Now, some people think that what we're looking at right here <clears throat> is her sarcophagus, like it's, a, it's, it's her tomb. And I've heard people explain it that way. Probably it's not. It's probably leftover things from a fountain and from parts of some of the medieval buildings that uh, have been modified over the years and all that. But it does look like a sarcophagus. But it's sort of a it's sort of a, unofficially a monument to Lady Devergill and the establishment of Ballet College. Your faith strengthened to believe that God providentially guides and governs all things. 